Hello, my name is Professor Matthew Schmidt and welcome back to genetics. We're going to continue our discussion of DNA structure and in particular in this session we're going to talk about DNA replication. We started to talk about it a little bit conceptually when we finished up last time in the sense that when Watson and Crick came up with their double helical model of the DNA molecule, right away they saw they couldn't verify it experimentally, but they saw a way that DNA could replicate itself. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but I was thinking about this earlier. When we say that DNA replicates itself, this could be potentially a little bit misleading. It's not as if you have a DNA molecule and then just all of a sudden it it alone makes a copy of itself. What that term means, and you'll hear it a lot, is that DNA possesses the information in the correct way that it is able to be copied so that two full new copies of the molecule result. As we're going to see, there is a ton of machinery that's sort of necessary for this process to work. So DNA copying itself sort of means informationally, not really you know, it's responsible for the process alone. Now, there's a lot on this slide, but I wanted to connect it with Watson and Crick's model of DNA structure. And remember, structure and function are always so intertwined and really you can't take them apart. So we had noted that one of the requirements for the genetic material was that it had to be able to replicate itself in the sense that we've said. And, you know, even Mendel could have told you that because he said that, uh, you know, when, well, perhaps more the, the chromosome people, but either way, it was known for a long time before we got to this point that when a cell copies itself, both of the two new cells have, you know, a full complement of chromosomes, for example. So somehow the DNA has to be replicating itself. And remember that Watson and Crick did realize that their model could provide a relatively easy conceptual explanation for how DNA replicates. We saw this, and I'll show you a picture again in a minute, but basically the idea was that, well, before I read what I have on the, on the slide here, just think of it. We said this, I think, before, and we'll say it again. If you know the base sequence of one side of one of the strands of the double helix, is it not true that you automatically know the base sequence of the other strand? It is true because of those base pairing rules, right? That A always goes with T and G always goes with C. So that's really the, the essence of this. So they said that they could envision, as I'm sure you can, the double helix sort of being unwound or unzipped and that each single strand now, them being separated from one another, would act as a template to construct a new strand because and solely relying on the base pairing rules and that would create two new at least informationally identical DNA molecules. Now a term that we haven't talked about before is that they noted that if this is the way that it happens that this replication process would be called semi-conservative or semi-conservative replication because as we're going to see in this model half of each newly replicated molecule consists of the old or original material and half of the material is new or newly synthesized. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail and we'll see that while it's great that Watson and Crick said it, experiments had to be carried out in order to verify that in fact this was what was going on. First I just wanted to show you the basic picture. I think we might have seen it last time, but if we didn't, we talked about the idea. So this is a just conceptual simplified model based on the double helical structure of DNA showing how Watson and Crick and perhaps others envisioned that it could be um, replicating itself. So above here you see sort of the traditional double helix and note that the sugar phosphate backbones, which are drawn as ribbons here, they're drawn in purple, and there's a reason for that. We want to be able to differentiate the old from the new in the sense of semi-conservative. So right here is where the replication is actually happening, but what we want you to see is that, let's follow this purple one down. I'm doing it in yellow. These two strands that I'm now copying in yellow, they were part of that original double helix, 
and they've unwound. Well, this this drawing is supposed to be sort of a composite of the process. We do have an animation uh, that I definitely suggest you look at that shows it unfolding in real time. And I mean both unfolding in time and literally unfolding the molecule as well. But, you know, a video, if a picture is worth a thousand words, an animation is worth at least a million. But I want you to understand here what's going on. So if those two strands came apart like that, now they're free. And new complementary bases are going to almost almost automatically join in. In other words, here's the reason. Look at this area here where we're putting our attention. So you could look at it from either side of the helix, but if there's a C in this position here, and there's a G in this position there, once it gets opened up, well, what's going to happen? See, these two parts down here have already been replicated. So but right here we're seeing, for example, here's an A, so we see a T coming in to join it there, right? Here's a T, we see an A coming in to join it there. So this is a process that's going on. And when you're done, notice that this whole molecule and this whole molecule, which eventually will become separate, are informationally identical. In other words, you have a CG, AT, AT here. You have the same thing over there. And if you look at every single base pair in both of those two new molecules, they're going to be identical. So this is the key conceptually to understanding how DNA has the power, if you will, to replicate itself. Um, now, as far as semi-conservative, the semi-conservative nature of this replication goes, look at this. In red, I'm going to go over, they're sort of in, in pink here, but I don't know if the drawing really gets it across. These are the newly made strands over here that I'm drawing in red. See, it's sort of, I hope this is making sense. Up here, there's no newly made strands in this area. Here is where the new nucleotides are coming in. And now we have two new molecules, but now you can see the idea of semi-conservative. So if this one here, once it becomes its own whole full new molecule, one half of it, that which is written in yellow here, is literally the same strand that existed up, I don't want to use that color, sorry, that existed, you know, up here that we were copying from before. It's literally the same. It unfolded, it unzipped, and it served as a template, but it's part of that new molecule. What's written in red over here represents the newly incorporated bases. So the semi-conservative idea says we get the split, each of the original strands acts as a template, and two new strands are built. Now, even though they're part old and part new, I keep saying informationally. In other words, if you forget about the, you know, the red and the yellow, if you just look at the nucleotides and the sequence information, they are literally identical in both of those two new molecules as they must be, right? So if we think of each of these two new molecules as daughter molecules, we have the old strand, which is written in purple on the diagram that I wrote in yellow, and the new strand, which is sort of pinkish on the diagram that I covered over in red, we see how this works. And it's, it's very symmetrical and almost mirror image-like. Not perfect analogy, but that's sort of what's going on. And what's happening is, uh, at the risk of too many things being being drawn in here, replication is proceeding in this direction. In other words, this part's going to get unzipped, and the same thing is going to happen as we go up until finally the whole thing has been copied, and we have two full new identical molecules. Right? That's what Watson and Crick said, at least. It was one of the reasons why their model was so widely accepted, and um, people said, yeah, that really makes sense. I mean... You may take it for granted. You may have been hearing for a very long time that DNA is a double helix and figure that's just the way it is. But it was not known, obviously, until they published this in, I believe, 1956. But being scientific, it's all well and good. And I mean that seriously, to, to propose a hypothesis about how DNA replicates itself. But uh, Watson and Crick were not experimental scientists, really. Um, uh, Crick went on to, to be one, but I...